Welcome to the second annual Hillsdale College Constitution Day celebration. I'm David Bob, director of Hillsdale's Alan P. Kirby Jr. Center for Constitutional Studies and Citizenship. We are glad that you've all joined us here today as we gather together with more than 60,000 citizens from all 50 states who have registered for this program. As the Constitutional Convention drew to a close, and just before the delegates signed the document on September 17, 1787, Benjamin Franklin wondered out loud to his fellow delegates whether, given the imperfection of human beings, with, as he said, all their prejudices, their passions, their heirs of opinion, their local interests and their selfish views, given all that, from such an assembly can a perfect production be expected? It was not perfect, but it was, Franklin said, and here I quote him, so near to perfection as to make him marvel at its accomplishment. I think, Franklin said, it will astonish our enemies who are waiting with confidence to hear that our councils are confounded like those of the builders of Babel. Today, when all too much of our own political discourse is little more than Babel, it is fitting that we reflect upon the accomplishment of America's founders, and it is fitting, too, that we celebrate their accomplishment. Even in the difficulty of the deliberations over the Constitution, Franklin saw fit to ponder the possibilities ahead for the country. As the convention came closer to success, Franklin said that the ornamental sun on the chair of the convention president, George Washington, poised in such a way as to make a viewer wonder if it was setting or rising, was surely a rising sun. Although many today see only a setting sun, I am happy to report that our first speaker today, the 12th president of Hillsdale College, is of the rising sun sort. Having served as director of research for Sir Martin Gilbert, Winston Churchill's official biographer, and then later having co-founded the Claremont Institute for the Study of Statesmanship and Political Philosophy, after which he led it for 15 years. Larry Arne has spent a lifetime reflecting on the demands of politics and the debt we today owe those who founded our country. Such reflection on the sacrifice of statesmanship, Dr. Arne demonstrates vividly in the classes he teaches on campus, on Aristotle, on Churchill, on the American Constitution, ennoble the, student, the souls of students and also helps them become better citizens. One sees in such study, and in his teaching, a rising sun indeed. I have to say that about the only time one doesn't see a rising sun sort of person in Larry Arne is if you are a young man on Hillsdale's campus, probably a freshman, and in the college cafeteria happen to be sitting next to the female object of your affection, and then unexpectedly you find yourself on the receiving end of direct queries from the president of the college as to how you, such an ugly and foolish one as you are, <laughs> could ever be worthy of the adulation of your beloved. As one who is happy to number himself among those who have learned much from our speaker, and yet also relieved that I've never been subject to his pointed questionings in the college cafeteria, I'm pleased now to give you the president of Hillsdale College, Dr. Larry Arne. Good morning. David, or D-Bob as we call him, is married to Anna. And uh, when she was his lady friend, not yet his fiance yet, I think at one of these dinners at a, at a Constitution Day dinner, I once asked her to stand up and then ask him why he didn't propose to her. <laughs> they have two kids now, so hey, I did that. <laughs> it's a crisis, isn't it? Uh, before we plunge into that terrible thing, uh, which we're going to fix, by the way. I'll just remind you that uh, life goes on. It's the purpose of a free government for life to go on. And back in Hillsdale, life's going on very nicely right now. Uh, we're ha we have our biggest student body ever. We didn't mean to, but uh, we have so many applications for our college now, and so many people come back. Our retention rates and, and all that are so high that uh, we our goal is to have a student body of 1,200, and then we set it to 1,300, and 
Right now we're at 1450. And uh, last Saturday night, uh, we played Division II sports at Hillsdale College. And last Saturday night, we beat the number four ranked team in the country in football. And uh, and I, I'm proud about that because uh, you probably know at Hillsdale, we're not in the prisoner taking business. So, so, so all of our football players on Monday morning, just like every other student in the college, got busy trying to get through the core curriculum, which is more than half of the time at Hillsdale College. And it means that those kids who did that are smart and hardworking and don't spend most of their time playing football. And that's not true of every college that plays football these days. <laughs> now about this crisis. We've had uh, more than a decade now to get used to it. Uh, Churchill said once in the middle of the Second World War, talking about the bombing of London, which by that time had gone on for three years. And you know, that means that <laughs> you get up in the morning and you've been disturbed in the night by the explosion of your neighbor's house. That's uh, bad. And Churchill said of it, uh, eels get used to skinning must be terrible to have to lose all your skin every year, but they get used to it. And we're getting used to this, but it's coming to a head. It has two parts, one at abroad and one at home. Uh, the one at, uh, uh, abroad is easy to state. We just had the anniversary of it. Uh, it's a combination of things. A very radical kind of ideology has come into the world for the last 150 or 200 years. And the latest expression of it is radical Islam. And it's like the others, it's utopian. It's a kind of messianic for things to happen here on this earth. They aim for a kind of heaven on this earth. They aim for everybody to be in conformity or compliance all over the earth. And anyone who's not is an enemy. Uh, they don't believe in the liberal society. And I'm gonna say something about that because those are in crisis too. And they think that they're weak and they may be right about that. And then something's added to them to make them important because they wouldn't be without this thing and that is technology has changed the world so very much and one of the ways it's changed it is it's really cheap to kill people. You can just do a lot of that now without much, I mean, if you just think about the fact that they knocked down two big buildings and killed several thousand people with some airplanes, it's an amazing feat in nature to be able to get that much weight up in the air at that much momentum and that power can be used to destroy a building as readily as it can be used to take people to Omaha. And if that's the nature of the world, then it's a very dangerous world. And those combinations of those two things threaten us all and they will continue to threaten us all for a long time. Our response to danger in the United States of America has always been to respond with the principles of the liberal society. And the liberal society is uh, a marvel, there's never been anything like it. It developed after a long time, it's a product of the civilization that defines the West. The coming together of the thought in, in uh, Athens about the right things for all people in all times, and in Jerusalem, the idea of one God for every human being. And those in their best aspects have given rise to a kind of society where the governments own the people, sorry exactly wrong, and one can see how that one would get that backwards these days. We're the people on the governments. We're the purpose of the government is to protect the people in their lives. Where the government is actually under the regular administration of the people, I mean by that, that it operates at all times with their consent. And they have practical ways on a regular basis to express or to withdraw that consent. And these societies have been just uh, absolute marvels in what they have achieved because each one of us in this room is a product of such a society and the phenomenon of all of us, and I'm, I'm told 60,000 people have registered to watch this thing on the internet, and uh, I hope they're not all unemployed, I bet they're not. <laughs> Probably most of them are time shifting, but, um, but all of them too, right? Because the modal American is like us. I like to say uh, there aren't many dukes and earls among us. 
My father was a school teacher in Pocahontas, Arkansas. Uh, it was a miracle that he went to college, a miracle that he wanted to. Nobody did in those days. And I grew up in a house where people like to read books. And the next thing you know, I can go study anywhere I want to. I did do I went to Oxford, for goodness sake. Met my girl, brought her home. I was lucky, see, she'd never seen anything like me, so she didn't know it was unusual. <laughs> That's the liberal society. And mark the point about it. it, ex it it's, a, it's a nexus, it's fulcrum, it's sensitive point, is at the place where the government meet the people. Because for there to be a liberal society, then private people must be in control of the government. This is about, this conference is about the Constitution of the United States. And that is the greatest device ever imagined. It is by far the most sex successful thing of its kind. And its specific achievement is to sustain over time a powerful government capable of standing up to our enemies in the world, capable of keeping order in our land, and yet under the control of people who spend most of their time doing something else than being involved with the government. That's an amazing, it's a miraculous development. And it's very powerful, this development. Because if you just think about it, as I say, these ideologies that torture the world, and they're related, these ideologies, you know, Marxism and National Socialism, they're forms of a common craziness. But a lot of these radical forms of Islam, they have something in common with that, right? You know, the Ba'athist parties in the, in the Middle East were founded with the help of the Gestapo. It's a, it's a historical fact. The, uh, the, uh, I think he's the uncle of Yasser Arafat, uh, was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. His name was Haj Amin al Husseini. And he was a powerful man in, through the Second World War. And he was a Gestapo officer. He was in the pay of the Gestapo. And there are lots of photographs. You can look them up on the internet. Haj, H-A-J, Amin, A-M-I-N, Al, A-L, Husseini. You probably know how to spell that, H-U-S-S-E-I-N-I. -S look them up, because there are photographs of him sitting having coffee with Adolf Hitler. These things have something in common, and they're, they're vile. And every time there has been a war between those organized, marshaled, regimes, they have been overwhelmed by the power of free peoples. Because here's what happens in a free country. I like to say in, in, at our college, which is a joyous place to work and fun and very effective, very successful these days, that the reason for that is that we're all doing it all the time. We have agreed a common end. And it's very difficult to pursue that end, and there's nothing but doubt as you go about it. You, you never know how to solve whatever problem's coming up, because you never have enough knowledge to be sure what the problem is. But you're just much more likely to be successful if everybody's working on it. And by the way, to make a little short contrast, it isn't characteristic of constitutional rule that detailed regulations are passed at the center and then handed down. And our government, as recently as 60 years ago, really had no apparatus for doing that. Maybe 70 years ago is fair, because I'm getting old, and so is this kind of government. It's powerful because it marshals the assistance of all, because it involves all. It includes all. It gets the best from all. It gives scope to all. It's a beautiful, hopeful thing. And I say there's a crisis at home because these kind of societies are in trouble. And it's just, a, it's, it's an easy fact. The facts are undeniable. In these liberal societies, where, as I say, the sensitive point is in the connection between the government and the peoples in these societies, these things are facts. These societies are near the peak, they're, they're down a little now, but they're near the peak of their historic wealth. They've never been significantly richer than they are at this moment, and 10 years ago they were richer than they had ever been. 
They were also richer than any society had ever been. And also it's true that their governments are a larger percentage of their societies in money spent and numbers employed than they have ever been, and those governments are broke. Now think that, right? The, the gross domestic product of the United States of America is about $15 trillion, and federal, state, and local spending in the United States of America is about $6.7 trillion, which is about 40%, which means that every time there's a dollar spent, 40 cents is government. But the health care bill is going to shift that balance some. And other things like that are going on, right? And at this level, right now, at that level of spending, the government is collecting about 60% of the revenues it needs to pay its bills. So it needs additional transfers of wealth to it, or it needs to restrain itself. And these facts are unprecedented. It's just. Uh, this has never happened in the Western world since liberal societies became the reigning thing. In wartime, it's true that the numbers got much bigger, but that was different for the simple reason that it wasn't the ordinary course of business. And this has now happened in the ordinary course of business. These wars that we are fighting that are very serious and could, could you know, result in the death of a soul by nightfall in this room, you know, the right thing happens or the wrong thing. This, this war has not really been very expensive, you know, compared to World War II or the Civil War. And so it's not the wars that are driving this, it's the ordinary routine course of business. And it's very hard to see how you work your way out of this. I mean, actually, we're going to be told, I guess, here in a few minutes because Congressman Ryan's coming. But, <laughs> but in England, for example, my wife is English. And her sister is actually here in town today and uh, lives in London, very nice woman. And uh, she, she's always lived in London. She lives in a nice neighborhood. And we got an email from her a few weeks ago, and it was like a report from a war front. There were riots near her home. She had to be careful about going outside. And her daughter, our niece, who has a new daughter, our grandniece, they live nearby too, and of course that means a young mother's in trouble, maybe. And the police watch that happen. And what is the character of these rioters? You'd think they'd be like the rioters that deposed uh, Louis to make the French Revolution, or Tsar Nicholas to make the Russian, that is to say, starving people. People who've got no hope. People who live under the thumb of an aristocracy, who dominate them until finally hunger and desperation drives them to the streets. That's not what they're like. They're all people who have shelter and food. And very many of them are people who live on the public largesse, either as employees of the government who don't want a cut in their pay, or people who receive transfer payments. And so when one tries to manage this problem that these governments are very large, larger than they've ever been as a percentage of the society, so that they don't go broke, cutting expenses is very difficult and has in many countries led to violence. Now that's a heck of a note if you think, and see, I haven't really said anything right now on one side or the other of this, this question, that is to say, what, what do I want? You probably know what I want, but I'm not talking about that right now. What I'm talking about is the, the, the nature and character of the societies in which we live is that they are liberal societies. And they have these constitutional arrangements they have on the view that ordinary people, all of them represented equally, all of them should be in control of the society and the government, and for that to happen, the government must be of a limited scope, and it's bigger than it ever was. In this country, it approaches half, and it isn't enough. And that means a decision is coming, and soon. 
because for a reason I'll explain here in just a second. It's um, this issues in certain political facts and the political facts are also very evident. If our economy is under stress now, terrible stress, and you know, it's, it's really funny. Uh, we were having an investment meeting at the college and I'm on the board of the Heritage Foundation. We had the same thing just yesterday there. Um, we were trying to figure out how to invest the money. And finally, and you know, we struggle with that all the time. I and mean, our college has done really well. I mean, it's really remarkable how well it's done. I think we've lost, I see Mr. Patrick Flannery back there. He's the man who knows, but uh, he's our treasurer. And he's sitting beside Ken Cole, who used to be, except Kenny's going to seed now. <laughs> but I think we lost 1.6% in the, in the bad pullback since June. And our endowment's really good. But you worry about it all the time, right? And how are you going to invest? Because there are two facts. And finally, yesterday, I was able to state them with clarity, at least for myself. The first fact is companies are doing very well, and their profits are high, and they're really cheap. The stock market is very undervalued. And you know, it's just, it's really dramatic too. I mean, it's uh, a friend of ours who's an economist over in Chicago says that uh, the, the stock market is undervalued right now by 65%. Isn't that interesting? I, I even think it's true, but there's this, and th that's not even very hard to understand if I were that kind of guy. I, I think I could even explain it to you now, quickly. But forget that. The other thing is imponderable. And that's the thing I've been talking about. Because is Italy, well, that's what's most like it. Is Greece, Greece going to go broke? The answer is it did, but <laughs> is Italy? And if that happens, what's gonna to happen to the big banks in France, which are the only ones they have? They're gonna be nationalized, and they did that once before, and that didn't go very well. And is Europe gonna fall apart? And you know, how are we gonna cope with this mess? Because, you know, another thing about it is, I said that these liberal societies are strong. They are very strong. In war, they're just terrible to deal with, right? I mean, has it been fun to be a member of Al-Qaeda in the last decade? You know, was, was Osama bin Laden's life rich and comfortable and at ease after he killed several thousand Americans? The answer is, he was hounded from cave to cave by people who are extremely good at that. And they were all volunteers for the work. And they took great delight and joy in what they did. And they lost comrades. And they mourned them and loved them and thought after that that their work was more worthy than it had been before. And then, you know, finally they found him. And that's the end of him. They're very good at that. But the other thing they're very good at is they can really produce. Because Lincoln said, God made every man with one head and one pair of hands and one mouth. And the implication was that the head should guide the hands in the feeding of the mouth. And if you set up a system like that, it's just amazing what happens. It's never been more apparent to me than since I went to work as a college president and a teacher. Because the marvelous thing came to me finally and I hadn't even understood it about my own education, which I ascribed exclusively to my teachers, and now I still do extensively, that it isn't that you teach them, they learn. And they have to work so hard to learn, because all that stuff that you know, that you, you know, first you were just so ignorant, you couldn't even carry on a conversation, or you know, you were alive with tension, trying to understand what the heck this person was talking about because you never heard anything like that before. At that moment, you're working a lot harder than that person is because what he's done is he started out that way and now he spent 20 years and 30 years, in my case, nearly 40 years, trying to figure a few things out, right? And that means that you see in the classroom, the labor of learning is done by the learner. And if they won't do it, you can't do it for them. And by the way, you love them when you watch them do it. It's fantastic. And you learn it's an iron fact. It can't be changed that there is no such thing and there can be no such thing as an entitlement to an education. Because you can't be given it. 
by somebody else's work. You can't. Any more than you can be given a living by somebody else's work. You see, and a society that's organized with the understanding of that is very productive. And if we leave that understanding, then at last I'll, you know, begin to talk on one side of the question. I think most so far mostly I haven't. It's hard for me, as you know. If you leave that kind of society, you're not going to produce as much and it's going to be harder to pay your bills. And then there's going to be more trouble. Whereas if you go back, do you ever hear Steve Forbes give a talk? He's one of my favorite people. You should listen to him if you get a chance. Because he talks about the hopeful side. He'll talk about all these debts. And then he can prove with simple math that if we got our growth rate up a couple of percent, that all these debts would start looking small. Because it's, they're going to have to be paid off over a long period of time. And if you make a small adjustment to how much you earn, then all of a sudden your capacity to do it is just much greater. And how would you make that adjustment? Green jobs is what I think. <laughs> I say you do too. <laughs> we have uh, political stresses, and they're acute, and they go along with these economic and these national security stresses. Because what should happen but that politics has become so very intense now and for a long time. The 2000 election was decided in the courts. And, uh, you know, for then, for eight years, everybody said that the winner, George Bush, was illegitimate. And that was because the election was so incredibly close that it came down to 500 votes in a large state. And that means there's pressure, right? There's difficulty. If you, if you uh, look at the way the health care bill was passed, it was incredibly uh, you know, midnight votes. And the, the Constitution has a way of asserting itself. I'm going to turn to a hopeful thing in a minute. I'm going to explain how it still does assert itself. But at the time, what were they doing, right? They lost an election in Massachusetts, and there, there's these constant adjustments because the, min the numbers are close. And in the Senate, they need an extraordinary majority because they have the, the institution of the filibuster. And that just means in the Senate, they believe they get to talk all they want to. And that's funny, but on the other hand, there are really two ways to rule. And one is reason and one is force. And reason and talking are synonyms. And so it's always been respected in the Senate that it's hard to get anything done because they get to talk a lot, you see? And so what did they do? They found ways, they didn't, they didn't overcome the filibuster. But they found ways by changing the nature of the bill for it to require a smaller majority. And this was done on several weekends and at midnight and after the whole effort was written off. And that means, by the way, it was done by people of incredible determination. They meant it. You know, Nancy Pelosi said two things and, and they're, they're good to compare. You, uh, the first one is, ugly to my ear, and she should be ashamed of it. But the second one is not. The first one, and by the way, you can find this first one on, on the internet, and you can hear her say what I'm about to say. And you can judge for yourself the tone of what she said. A, a, a reporter from CNN asked her, what authority is there in the Constitution for, you, for the government to compel somebody to buy health insurance? And she replied, are you serious? Are you serious? That was her answer. There wasn't any more answer. And t to my ear, her tone sounds derisory. That's a remarkable reaction for the Speaker of the House to make on the eve of doing such a dramatic thing. Because by the way, she's been in the Congress a long time. She took an oath, right? Uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. That's what she took. And she's taken it many times. Are you serious? Are you serious, she said. Now, I think they passed the bill on a Sunday afternoon. 
And I went and looked up her speech just before they voted. And of course, you know, she wouldn't have brought the thing to the vote if she didn't know she had the votes. And she said that uh, her speech is very pretty. You can find it. In fact, I've just finished the book, and it's quoted in the book. It'll be out about Christmas time. But it's, it's very handsome what she says. She says, uh, today we keep faith with the authors of the Declaration of Independence. She said, we, we get to fulfill the words that all men are created equal. You see? And what that means, mind you, that means, you know, first of all, it's just can't be doubted that she did this and those who did this, they did this for love. They did this because they think this is a good thing to do, right? And once you absorb that information, that means that the disputes we have among us are very real. And that means that you're only going to get through them if you can argue through them, or else you're going to fight. And you don't want to fight. You want to be able to reason through this, because the questions are very fundamental now. Because what she thinks, what the Speaker of the House thinks, is that the Declaration of Independence demands the health care bill, and there's a tacit admission that the Constitution of the United States does not permit it. And so she has separated those things. Do you see? And there is a large scholarship grown up among us to justify her doing that. Joseph Ellis, uh, do you know who he is? He, he's, he's very good. He's an academic historian who writes books that are, however, popular. People love to read them. And I like to read them. He's very good. I like him. And it's just that he's foolish. Um, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. You know, he wrote Founding Brothers. It's a very good book. You should read that book. But he wrote lately American Creation, and that's more foolish. Because he says in the book, he says this, he says, the Declaration of Independence treats government as an alien force. He says that. Now, the Declaration of Independence is about 1,500 words long. Have you ever read it? Did you, you know probably that it's divided into three parts. There's a beginning, which is very beautiful. Everybody knows what it says. I'll quote it to you. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands that have connected them to another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. There is the birth of the liberal society in its most beautiful and brilliant language. And that echoes in the hearts of every free person, always has since the day it was wrote, and always will. That's the beginning. The end is an official act sealed with a blood oath. In support of this declaration, you know, trusting to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Are you telling me he's here now? No. What are you telling me? That's Kyle back there. He used to be in my class. Now he works for me, and he's not making any sense to me. <laughs> you want me to talk for five minutes? Okay. Some of this is live, and so all of you who are watching on the internet, please pretend that this tape has been edited. <laughs> so that's perfect, five minutes. So, Ever notice the contrast between the beginning of the document and the end? Because the beginning of the document is universal, right? It's really amazing. I, I, I'll give you an example. Um, D. Bob married Anna, right? She's too pretty for him. I married Penny. She's too pretty for me. And that was a very big day in our lives when we did that. And so it wasn't our spirit on that day, our day, the day on which we founded our family. It wasn't our spirit to talk that day about how everybody does this, and when you do this, there's a certain way you have to behave. There are rituals and forms that you have to follow, but of course all of the talk is about how our circumstances are really special. 
you know, the best wedding I, you know, I'm, I'm accustomed to say now when I go to somebody's wedding, that's the second best wedding I ever saw, right? You know, yours would be better than mine, except you didn't get to marry Penny. <laughs> so you see, we love to talk about what's special, what makes us the thing, what makes our thing the thing, right? And the Death Race of Independence, they're very much in that mood, right? Because at the end, did you know there was a warrant out for the people who signed the Declaration of Independence. And it was a hanging offense to sign it. In support of this declaration, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Right? Isn't that lovely? And that's the end. But the beginning is when in the course of human events, that's any time, it becomes necessary for one people, that means any people, to do, you know. In other words, they start out talking as if this is kind of routine and there are rules about it and here's how we are going to obey those rules. And that combination of the universality of the beginning and the particularity of the end is unique among political documents. And that's one of the things that makes it the greatest. What comes in between those two things but a large, long series of charges against the king? And remember I said that Joseph Ellis said that it treats government as an alien force. Well, remember in the first paragraph what the Declaration of, say, of Independence is saying is that any people has a right to form a people. That it starts out, by the way, with the, the rights of a people, not the individual. But then in the charges against the king, do you, can anybody remember what the first one is? Greg Statura is sitting back there. I bet he knows. He doesn't know. It's a shocker. The, the first charge against the king, remember, he says it treats government as an alien force, right? The first charge is he, against King George III, he has refused his assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. So one of the reasons we rebel against him is that he's not providing the proper kind of government. But if that's true, and remember, I'm gonna summarize now because our speaker is here. Hello, Congressman. I'm just getting ready to lambaste you. <laughs> because you, sir, have made a bad decision. <laughs> Everybody knows what I'm talking about. So, but if you don't, stay tuned. So, if the Speaker of the House, acting, by the way, remember, from high motives, praise her for that. It's not a question of who wants to do justice. It's a question of what is justice. That is the question we must answer. And the consequences are enormous. But what she says is she will follow the Declaration of Independence and not the Constitution. And then I quote a historian who says, that the Declaration treats government as an alien force, and he goes on in this quote to say that the Declaration and the Constitution are opposite documents, but they aren't. And I, I, you know, we're gonna have five of these lectures, and if you wanna watch the rest of them, all of you out there and all of you here, you'll find out that I'm giving several of them, and that what I do is explain how the Constitution of the United States is actually written in the Declaration of Independence, and it has three chief aspects. The first is government must be representative. It has to work for us, but also we don't get to be in the government. We can only control it through elections. And because of that feature, the government never has ultimate authority inside itself, nor do the people who have ultimate authority ever get to act except through the government. Representative government is fundamental. Second, the powers of government must be separated. If you just read the charges against the king, it says that he has messed with the judges and he has messed with our representative institutions and the legislatures and he's trying to be all three things. Of course, the, the, the Declaration of Independence mentions God four times and among the four mentions are one is each branch of the government, supreme judge of the world, maker of the laws of nature and of nature's God, divine providence. The lesson being only in the hands of God would all of the branches be combined. And then finally, the government must be limited 
so that the society can be a liberal society. He has sent among us swarms of officials to eat out our substance and oppress our people. It is a form of constitutionalism that is then elected, sorry, then established in the greatest constitution ever written. And the two documents are in fact, whenever they speak of rule, synonymous in their meaning. And the great battle is going to be whether they can be united again. Now our guest of honor is a favorite person of mine and I'm cranky with him. He, uh, he comes from Wisconsin. Uh, you can see his character in the fact that uh, not long ago, friends of mine in, uh, asked me to intervene with him because I was going to be talking with him to get him to give a speech. And I said, these guys really want you to give a speech. You better go give the speech. And he said, you know, it's deer hunting season. <laughs> he said, and I've, I've never missed that. And uh, my response was, okay, that's a good cause. <laughs> He, he's doing it, I think. He's like that. He's a father of three. He comes from a little town in Wisconsin. His career is, he went to Miami of Ohio, a college in Ohio, a rival, by the way, to be the second best college in the Michigan, Ohio area. <laughs> and uh, I've never looked at his grades, but I bet I could find them. I don't know if he would have got into our college or not. <laughs> But if he had, he'd know more. <laughs> he worked for uh, Jack Kemp and Bill Bennett. They're, he's buddies with Jack, the late Jack Kemp and Bill Bennett, and he are still good buddies. He learned a lot from them. He worked for Brownback. He got elected to Congress in 1998. Now, what he, what he, there are just two things to know about him. One is what he's done, and the other is what he is. And I, I might know what that second thing is. I know I know what he's done. If it's true that we're in a position where the liberal society may be about to disappear, and if it's true that the sensitive point is in the, is in the scale and scope and nature of the relations between the people and the government, then what one would have to understand and know inside and out would be the way that this federal budget works. And that is surely the most boring and hideous subject in human history except that now it's also a dangerous subject, so it's not boring anymore. And the person who learns about it, first of all, he's gonna to have to have a heck of a mind to be able to know about it. But then second of all, he's gonna to have to have courage to speak the truth about it, because to speak the truth about it is to call for things to be reduced that have large constituencies in favor of them. And so that's why so many don't even talk about that subject. And this man has made himself master of it. You know, as, as no one I have ever seen. Why did he do that? I think it's his character. He's a good listener. He's very well spoken. Things come easy to him. And yet he doesn't seem to become arrogant. He loves his children, thinks he's working for them. Refused to run for president because he's foolish, went to the wrong college. <laughs> but I was one of those who urged him to do that. And I did that because, because of the right reason. I don't know if he could win. I, I don't, I know he's the right kind. And I know when he talks, the people get what they've got coming to them, which is the truth and a chance to choose about it. Welcome, Speaker of the Truth, Paul Ryan. Wow. No pressure. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Larry. Like I said, no pressure there. Um, 
What do you say? Um, thank you for that kind introduction. I, I really appreciate that. You've been a true friend to Liberty and, and to me as well. Um, it's always a pleasure for me to speak here uh, to Hillsdale folks. Uh, the mission you have here at the Kirby Center in Washington is a great example of what Hillsdale is all about. In the words of James Madison, liberty and learning, each leaning on the other for their mutual and surest support. Uh, in addition to those of you who are here with us today, uh, I'm told that these remarks are being broadcast by webcast to the benefit of Hillsdale students back in Michigan, where right now it's about 8.30 in the morning, or to most college students, the crack of dawn. <laughs> so your scholarly passion for human freedom must be powerful indeed. This Saturday, we celebrate the 224th anniversary or birthday of the Constitution written by the framers in Philadelphia. In paying tribute to this inspired document, I want to talk about how we should think about the Constitution and why, especially today, this matters. Usually, our defense of the Constitution is presented as a defense of Americans' founding principles and our values, and rightfully so. But our constitutional system is not just a collection of principles. It embodies an approach to government with profound practical implications for both our freedom and our prosperity. When that system is threatened, both freedom and prosperity suffer. Freedom is lost by degrees, and the deepest erosions usually take place during times of economic hardship, when those who favor expanding the sphere of government abuse a crisis to persuade free citizens that they should trade in a little of their liberty for empty promises of greater security. Well, we all remember what Benjamin Franklin said about that trade, that those who would make it deserve neither liberty nor security. But in such cases, when liberty is lost, it is our fault as champions of the Constitution for failing to mount a sufficiently persuasive and effective defense. And I believe our defense falls short when we fail to connect our timeless principles and values to the urgent economic issues facing the factory worker in Janesville, Wisconsin, who's suddenly unable to provide for his family. Or, in some of your cases, the recent college graduate who finds herself in one of the worst job markets in recent history. We can strengthen our defense of liberty if we remember to keep in mind those who are struggling to make ends meet. What makes our Constitution such an extraordinary document is that in making the United States the freest civilization in history, the founders guaranteed that it would become the most prosperous as well. The American system of limited government, low taxes, sound money, and the rule of law has done more to help the poor than any other economic system ever designed. I want to talk today in particular about the last of those, the rule of law, which is absolutely essential to all other benefits of our system to the prosperity and freedom of our country, and to the well-being of all Americans, especially the most vulnerable. Well, what is the rule of law? Larry just talked about it. When the Declaration of Independence cited as justification the laws of nature and nature's God, the founders were channeling Aristotle, who wrote that the rule of law in principle means that, quote, God and intellect alone rule. Aristotle defined the law as intellect without appetite by which he meant justice untainted by the self-interest of those in power. The great difficulty we encounter in striving to meet Aristotle's idea was best summed up, I think, by James Madison. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. And if angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. But as Madison remind us, men are no angels, and the government is administered by men over men. Grounded in a proper understanding of human nature, our founders tackled this challenge head-on with a brilliant constitution and a healthy separation of powers, binding all men to the same set of laws and preventing any one man or group of men from gaining enough power to declare themselves above the law. The Constitution secures rights long understood to be essential to the rule of law, such as the right to due process, meaning that the laws of the land must be transparent, consistent, and equally applied to all men, 
so that no man may be arbitrarily deprived of life, liberty, and property. This constitutional cornerstone of our free society is also a critical precondition to a free and dynamic society and economy. Without the rule of law to safeguard the ownership of property and the enforcement of contracts, it makes little sense for an investor to put his capital at risk, helping an entrepreneur to pursue a dream, to advance an idea, and ultimately grow a business that creates good paying jobs for Americans. For decades, the U.S. economy has been a magnet for investors, entrepreneurs, and workers because we enjoy some of the strongest and most transparent legal protections in the world. These protections provide a stable environment for business investment, stability that is totally undermined when the discretionary power of bureaucrats is enhanced. Many countries around the world are remained mired in grinding poverty for lack of the institutions necessary to guard property and contracts from the appetites of local despots and their cronies. Their economies are highly unstable, and the fate of the business investment is often subject to the whims of a single person or a small group of bureaucrats. The good news is that the United States still enjoys an enormous edge over most of the world when it comes to the strength of our institutions and our reputation for respecting the rule of law. But we are moving in the wrong direction, and we would be fools to believe that the job creators of this country have not noticed that. Let me give you just a few examples of how the rule of law in this country has been degraded over the past several years and replaced by the rule of man. The first, monetary policy. I'm not suggesting that the Federal Reserve has done anything illegal, treacherous, or even treasonous. <laughs> but I do believe that Congress has delegated far too much arbitrary authority to the Fed. And that in recent years, the Fed has trended too far toward discretionary and away from rules-based monetary actions. Small changes in monetary policy can have really big economic consequences. And the central bank can serve as a major source of economic instability. In 1993, Stanford economist John Taylor developed a rule to improve the stability and predictability of U.S. monetary policy. An untold economic success story in the 1990s is the Fed's adherence to price stability, thanks in large part to John Taylor's key insights. Unfortunately, the Federal Reserve abandoned the so-called Taylor Rule roughly a decade ago after the, tech, after the tech bubble collapsed. And a growing body of evidence supports the idea that the Fed kept interest rates too low for too long throughout the past decade, helping to fuel the enormous housing bubble that caused the financial crisis of 2008. The central bank continues to pursue a misguided policy of arbitrary decision-making that is contributing to economic uncertainty and, in my opinion, causing more harm than good. Next, energy and an environmental policy. I think the Obama administration's actions here offer a perfect example of what happens when you concentrate too much discretionary power into the hands of unaccountable bureaucrats. <clears throat> Remember, in 2007, a wrong-headed Supreme Court decision cleared the way for the Environmental Protection Agency to unilaterally regulate greenhouse gases if the agency found that such gases may reasonably be anticipated to endanger public health or welfare. As soon as the EPA's chief from the Obama administration took office, reasonably was unreasonably defined. And the agency issued finding after finding that would produce real economic harm in exchange for distant and dubious environmental ends. Well, with Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid then running Congress, the administration first pushed for legislation resembling the European Union's cap and trade system. Because of the EPA's power grab, affected industries faced the old good cop, bad cop routine. It was either play ball with Pelosi or else the EPA could be counted upon to come up with something even worse. Given the options, it's no surprise that a who's who of big corporations lined up to support their bill once their priorities were met, even though most Americans remain strongly opposed to this legislation. This bill passed the House, but it was unable to overcome bipartisan concerns in the Senate. Cap-and-trade legislation was deemed costly, economically harmful, 
and ineffective in its means and its goals. But instead of accepting this verdict on its preferred policy, the administration decided to let the EPA carry on with its harmful plan to impose unilateral emissions restrictions on American businesses, which raises the question, why does the Constitution establish a lawmaking body at all? While the EPA has been busy pushing commercially competitive, punishing commercially competitive sources of energy, the Department of, e of Energy, under President Obama's direction, has been acting like the world's worst venture capital fund. <laughs> Picking winners and losers, mostly losers these days, <laughs> by spending recklessly on uncompetitive alternatives. For our evidence, look no further than Solyndra, a solar panel company that recently received $500 million in stimulus-funded loan guarantees. <laughs> Last month, Solyndra filed for bankruptcy and laid off its employees. And the story just keeps getting worse by the day. The federal government's job is to make and enforce sensible rules of the road so that markets are fair, transparent, and competitive. When bureaucracy is empowered to reward politically well-connected firms at the expense of economically competitive ones, this weakens the rule of law. It wastes taxpayer dollars, and it makes sustainable job creation that much harder to achieve. Another example. We have seen a lot of damaging economic adventurism in the area of financial services lately. TARP was supposed to be confined to a narrow emergency and used to avoid precisely the kind of situation I described at the beginning of this speech, an economic calamity in which politicians promising security in return for a loss of freedom would do enormous damage to the cause of liberty. Needless to say, it was disappointing when the Bush administration approved the use of TARP funds for the bailouts of General Motors and Chrysler. This entrenched the idea that TARP could be used as a slush fund for just about any kind of economic intervention, regardless of the fact that the original bill charged the program to, quote, purchase troubled assets from any financial institution. That was bad, but the greater damage came later when the Obama administration used that bailout to trample the rights of Chrysler secured bondholders, including state pension funds, in order to give politically favored groups a better deal than they were entitled to receive under the bankruptcy law. This makes it less likely that institutions safeguarded, in charge of safeguarding people's life savings, will invest that money in ways that create jobs in the United States. The Dodd-Frank overhaul made financial services matters that much worse. Dodd-Frank involves radical changes to financial regulation, changes that will affect every feature of our financial services industry, increase the power of current federal regulatory agencies, and creates new ones. For example, the FDIC may now take control of any financial institution if a panel of regulators under the Treasury Secretary sees a danger of systemic risk, which is up to the regulators to define. Moreover, smaller institutions do not receive the protections given to big firms under this law. That results in unequal treatment as well as higher borrowing costs compared to their larger competitors. Dodd-Frank promotes the rule of bureaucrats to our economic detriment, inviting political corruption while further degrading self-government. The next case involves a troubling overreach, which I'm going to have the pleasure of voting on in about a half hour that we've seen from this administration's appointees to the National Labor Relations Board. The most notorious case involves Boeing, which the NLRB is suing over its decision to locate a new factory in South Carolina instead of union-friendly Washington State. The board's actions are threatening hundreds of jobs. But this isn't the only example of the board's overreach. Early in his administration, the president promised labor leaders that he would work to pass a card check bill to make union organizing easier. But just like cap and trade, car check failed in Congress. So the NLRB simply issued new union election rules that would, in the words of one former board member, quote, achieve the primary objectives of card check by administrative rule without the need for tough congressional votes, unquote. <laughs> Again, with agencies like this, what do you need Congress for? <laughs> More generally speaking, we should not be surprised to find organized labor leading the charge for more bureaucratic discretion in federal rulemaking. 
An agency that is free to broadly interpret its statutory authority is one that can unilaterally broaden its size and its scope, and in the process, it can increase the size and influence of the public sector unions to which its employees belong. Last case, the president's health care law. This one's a doozy. <clears throat> Let me share with you a figure that serves as a devastating indictment of the new law. So far, over 1,400 businesses and organizations have been granted temporary waivers from the law's onerous mandates. These waivers do not guarantee relief in the future, which is why I like to refer to them as stays of execution. <laughs> Nor do they help the firms that lack the connections to lobby for the waivers. The powerful discretion assumed by HHS to play judge in determining these stays of execution does tremendous damage to the rule of law. The president's health care overhaul undermines the rule of law in so, so many other ways as well. The new law empowers a panel of 15 unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats in Washington to cut Medicare in ways that will deny benefits for current seniors. The new board's recommendations would become law unless a supermajority voted affirmatively to replace these recommendations, a high hurdle that raises constitutional questions about whether Congress can legitimately grant this much lawmaking authority to an unelected agency. Look, I'm not trying to question the intentions of those who have decided to make Medicare spending less accountable to the democratic process. I, I think they truly believe that it is better to let government appointed experts make these kinds of decisions free from the checks and balances that define our messy democratic process. But in weakening the rule of law in the United States, their intentions are totally irrelevant. The damage they have done is real. And the relevant question we have to ask ourselves is whether, as Ronald Reagan put it, we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital can plan our lives better for us than we can plan them ourselves. If we succumb to this view that our problems are bigger than we are, if we surrender more control over our economy to the governing class, then life in America will become defined by a new kind of class warfare, a class of bureaucrats and connected crony capitalists trying to rise above the rest of us, call the shots, rig the rules, and preserve their place atop society. And their gains come at the expense of working Americans, entrepreneurs, and that small businesswoman who has the gall to take on the corporate chieftain. The Constitution's framers knew that there is a human inclination to increase personal power at the expense of law. So they created a Congress as decentralized and an internally divided institution. But they granted it ample authority to secure the rule of law in every case. Congress holds the power of the pen as well as the power of the purse. It has the power necessary to address the attacks on the rule of law in our executive bureaucracies and even in the courts. The Constitution provides us with the power to solve these problems. What we need is the will to do it. The solution, the defense of the rule of law, will have to involve alternative ways to address the public problems that too many of our friends on the left want to solve by simply delegating power to bureaucrats. For every government curtailment of our liberty through the discretion of bureaucrats, there are alternative reforms that could address these same problems within the framework of the rule of law. And indeed, they could address these problems more effectively. House Republicans have proposed a policy agenda to do just that, reclaiming America's exceptional promise, charting a path not only toward fiscal sustainability, but also to renewed prosperity, restoring the rule of law, reducing the influence of bureaucrats in the lives of Americans, and empowering them to take more control over their own lives is central to the budget we passed earlier this year. In fact, such reforms go hand in hand with our efforts to lift the crushing burden of debt, to secure our social safety net, and to spur job creation and sustained economic growth for all Americans. In monetary policy, Congress must refocus the Federal Reserve on price stability within a clear rules-based system because businesses and families alike need sound money to invest, to grow, and to prosper. In energy, Congress must limit the EPA's discretionary power to impose a unilateral vision 
of the job-destroying cap-and-trade system. In financial services, Congress needs to establish a regulatory environment that is fair, predictable, and reasonable. In labor policy, Congress needs to rein in an agency that is threatening job creation by overreaching its mandate, and to make sure that we have a public sector that works for the people it serves and not the other way around. And in health care, we just need to repeal the President's new disastrous health care law. Yeah. That way, we will diminish the power of unelected bureaucrats over the system and give that power to individuals and families by advancing reforms that harness the power of choice and competition in health care. Rather than increasing the size and scope of central administration, let us champion an agenda guided by the American idea of equal rights under law. Let's begin to remove the hurdles that government has erected. Legislative reform should empower people, families, and computers, and communities, excuse me, not bureaucrats and their cronies. The American idea unites liberty and law in a bond that must never be severed. America can win back the promise of individual liberty, a promise we have and we have continued to shed blood to defend. But the time has come to honor our Constitution's limits on arbitrary bureaucracy and return to the rule of law to make it the center of our government. And look, looking out here on the faces today, and knowing that some of you woke up at the crack of dawn at 8.30 a.m. to watch online, I am hopeful, I am confident and optimistic because of Hillsdale and others that a new generation is coming to the study of politics with a real appreciation to the Constitution and its centrality to ensuring justice and security in our communities, to promoting the welfare and prosperity of all people, and to securing the blessings of liberty to ourselves and for our children. By respecting the rule of law, reclaiming the prominence of our Constitution, and reforming our government, I have no doubt that we, the people working together, can help ensure that the next generation of citizens inherits a stronger, freer, more prosperous America and a more perfect union. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thank you. I apologize. I intended to stay and do Q and A, but. Um, a vote is being called to rein in the NLRB and to swear in two new members of Congress, and I don't want to miss those two events, all right? So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.